Good evening, friends. Uh, uh, good day wherever uh, you are joining us from. And uh, also hello to everyone who will be watching this on YouTube afterwards. My name is Nick Matheu and I'm the Programme Manager at the Armenian Institute in London. Uh, and uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the third in our series, Reintroducing Ani uh, 900 to 2021. Uh, just a few housekeeping things first. This meeting is being recorded. Um, so if you wouldn't like to uh, appear, the, the recording will only be of the spotlighted screen. Um, but if you are uh, going to be joining us, if you would like to ask a question but wouldn't like to um, uh, to appear on, the, on screen yourself, um, please do make use of the stop video function uh, or you can ask questions into the chat. Uh, you can ask those as they as we go along, uh, and I can ask them myself at the end, uh, or you can save them up to us and ask yourselves. Uh, this series, I should say, is co-hosted between the Armenian Institute and the Association for the Protection of Cultural Heritage in Turkey, or KMKD, uh, and it is dedicated to one of KMKD's co-founders, Osman Kavala, uh, who's been imprisoned now for 1,353 days on spurious, politically motivated charges. Uh, Osman Bey's been very dedicated to the preservation of cultural heritage of all the peoples of Anatolia, Upper Mesopotamia and Caucasia. Uh, and he knows that this uh, series is happening um, and the project that we hope that it will launch to a long-term transnational collaboration. So we dedicate this to Osman Bey. And if you are interested in being involved in the long term uh, and the work to promote the preservation and research of the city of Arni, then please do get in touch with me at nick, N-I-K, at armenianinstitute.org.uk. But for this evening, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Professor Hegenar Wattenbog, uh, who's the Professor of Art and Architecture uh, and Urban History of the Middle East, as well as Cultural Heritage and Museum Studies at the University of California, Davis. Um, like all of our speakers, uh, Hegenar doesn't need much introduction, but I will do anyway. Her first book, The Image of an Ottoman City, was uh, award-winning, uh, as was her most recent book, uh, from 2019, The Missing Pages, The Modern Life of a Medieval Manuscript, um, which has the amazing accolade of being uh, the first book to receive prizes from both the Society of Armenian Studies and the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. Uh, Hegenar has published widely uh, on uh, the art and architecture of the Middle East, um, and most importantly for tonight, has also been involved for a long time um, with uh, initiatives around cultural heritage, preservation, and the city of Arni in particular, um, including working closely with Osman Bey. If you uh, missed the first two in the series, the first um, by myself on the history of Arni, uh, and the second uh, by Christina Maranci uh, on, uh, on, on the citadel of Arni and its archaeology, um, then you can catch up with those on the Armenian Institute's YouTube page. Um, but I think that Hagna is now here, so I will. Great. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Tato, Stephen, and everyone at um, the Armenian <laughs> Institute and, and Kame Kade. Thank you for uh, developing this idea and for creating this really wonderful series um, where I've already learned so much and I learned, I look forward to learning a lot more. So let me share uh, my screen. Okay. And can you all see it? Yes. yes awesome. Perfectly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, T today, I want to talk about a particular aspect of Ani. Um, I defined what cultural heritage is, and um, so to summarize a little bit the work that I've done on Ani in the past, I focused on um, uh, thinking about how Ani became uh, an, a, a, an area where various kinds of processes of preserving, conserving, interpreting the past has taken place. 
Um, today, I'm going to switch into something slightly different, which is Ani as an object of memory and imagination, and especially for artists and um, creative types. Um, so it's another aspect of, um, uh, of interpreting and preserving Ani as an object of cultural heritage. And I'm particularly interested in the idea of how do you make heritage about a site that is inaccessible or distant for any number of reasons? Um, and how can we understand and theorize um, the, uh, the process of creating heritage from a distance? Um, and how that can be part of, you know, the kinds of futures that we are all here together imagining for Ani. So I want to begin by recalling the emergence of Ani in the modern imagination in the 19th century. Um, and, um, uh, of course, uh, when um, modern travelers around the middle of the 20th century and modern scholars discovered, quote unquote, Ani, it appeared as a Christian city from the medieval past emerging from the fog of time. It was often called Armenian Palmyra, Palmyra being, of course, the great city in Syria that was also in the process of being rediscovered by the uh, modern imagination. Um, um, in that case in Syria. Um, so uh, we know a little bit about the discovery of Ani, but one of the things that I want to highlight here is that um, uh, the local actors and local intellectuals were very involved in this discovery of Ani, unlike other sites like Palmyra, where uh, the voices that one hears are mostly those of uh, foreign scholars or tourists. Um, uh, in their no so orientalist and other notion of uh, these uh, deserted, um, uh, seemingly deserted uh, uh, ghost cities. In the case of Ani, uh, the photographers like Ohanes Kirkjan, uh, who was uh, from the area, a very interesting person, um, and other intellectuals were uh, part of a rediscovery of what they saw very clearly as their own past. So it is very unique among the archaeological sites uh, that in the Middle East and the South Caucasus that came uh, to the fore in the late 19th, early 20th century, in that the local community, local intellectuals were very much involved in um, understanding the site, making sense of it, and interpreting it. And there were a number of different interpretations circulating around the same time. And early photographers, 19th century photographers like Kirkjian, uh, played a tremendous role in uh, fixing the image of Ani. What is the what is the photograph that captures Ani uh, was one of their preoccupations. Uh, there's a lot to say about the history of photography at Ani, but I am going to set it aside because it has been studied beautifully by Vigen Galestian, uh, the art historian and curator based in Yerevan, whom I had the pleasure of speaking to a couple of uh, days ago, when maybe he can present um, his really important and interesting work on these photographers at some point in this lecture series. The person I want to highlight right now is uh, Khachadur Apovian, um, the, uh, you know, the polymath and founder of uh, Armenian literature, the very interesting modern um, uh, seminal figure in the development of uh, especially Eastern Armenian language and literature and ideas. Um, we, of course, all know his famous uh, novel, Ver Kayastani, The Wounds of Armenia, published uh, posthumously in 1858, um, that is seen as um, you know, a key work of the development of Armenian, modern Armenian consciousness and Armenian nationalism. Um, those of you who know this work probably recall that a key scene 
uh, from it takes place in uh, in Ani. It is set in the city of Ani, where the hero of the novel, Ahasi, and his compatriots, um, you know, the important events take place there that suggest a deep connection between these modern patriots like Ahasi and the city of Ani as a symbol of lost Armenian sovereignty. So this uh, idea that uh, becomes very clearly established uh, in the um, Ar Armenian thought uh, of Ani as uh, a symbol of lost Armenian sovereignty is already expressed here in the middle of the 19th century. And um, this is um, interesting because um, um, uh, Apovian himself visited Ani and he wrote a travelogue about Ani uh, in Russian um, in uh, around 1841. And this you're seeing here um, a translation of a translation into Armenian of it when it was published in the complete works of Apovian in the Soviet period. So um, I just want to highlight Apovian as this, um, uh, this, this key local figure uh, who lays the ground work for these ideas of thinking about Ani um, as a symbol in the modern Armenian imagination and Armenian nationalist thought. So the next stage, of course, in the late 19th and early 20th century that uh, makes a tremendous difference in the way Ani is perceived are the excavations um, uh, conducted uh, by Nikolai Marr and his team. And his team, of course, notably includes, this is the famous photo of Marr that we saw last week, also um, in Christina Maranzi's presentation. Um, and it's important to note that the Marr's team, even though he was sponsored by the St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences, it was very much a Russian imperial project. Uh, many members of his team were Armenians who, from the Caucasus, but also importantly, Armenians from the Ottoman Empire. Toros Toramanyan, the great architectural historian who was very active at Ani, and uh, Professor Maranci uh, talked about his work and his research at Ani last week, was of course an Ottoman Armenian. So for Armenians from all uh, uh, all of the states um, in this area, uh, Ani becomes a beacon and a, a place where um, the, the present of the Ar Armenian communities is connected to a particular imagined past. Um, of course, the, um, the excavators at Ani turned the Mosque of Minuchir building uh, into a museum, and there was also a purpose-built museum nearby where the finds of the archaeologists were displayed. And one of the most um, celebrated finds is, of course, the statue of King Gagik I of the Bagratid dynasty, which was excavated in 1906 and is uh, lost. Um, since the Second World War. Um, the, there's a lot of information there about how people perceived Ani. So now I'm departing from the way in which scholars approach the statue. I mean, for if we put on our scholar hats, we see a statue like this that features a, a ruler wearing a turban and a cross holding originally a model of the church. There's a lot of interesting things to say here about medieval patronage and about cross-cultural uh, currents um, in the kind of visual culture that was prevalent in Bagratid Ani. But now now I want to focus on how uh, visitors and members of the Armenian community, especially in the early 20th century, came to perceive the statue of Gagik, and that was as a very concrete symbol of lost sovereignty. Um, what I'm showing you is a 1909 uh, photograph taken very deliberately. This is a very deliberate, very staged, very meaningful photograph that shows the Catholicos of Echmiadzi, Mateos Izmirlian, who was, by the way, an Ottoman Armenian and former patriarch of Constantinople. Um, he uh, undertook a 
formal patriarchal pilgrimage from Ichmiadzin to Ani. And this was uh, accomplished with great pomp and circumstance as the first patriarchal visit to Ani in um, seven centuries. Um, and so Izmirian, this is a, a, not just a, a visit, but also a, a major religious and political event, which has been um, uh, chronicled not only in photographs, but in a very important book by uh, another Ottoman Armenian priest, Grigori Spalakian, in his book uh, Ani Averat Mera, or The Ruins of Ani, that Professor Moranzi has recently um, studied um, a, a critical examination of how we can um, uh, think about this book and what it means for the history of architecture of Ani. Here I want to focus on this photograph to, to make the point that um, you know, we're seeing here very clearly how for religious leaders and the community, um, the connection between past sovereignty and the current situation of the community is, is very clear and filtered through on me. And I'm going to read a very short excerpt from um, a book by Aram Varuir, one of the photographers who worked with Mar, uh, entitled Aniyum at Ani. And here he shows, he, he, he discusses visitors to the museum looking upon the statue. So, quote, um, the statue of Gagik I, the great peace-loving and wise king of the Armenian world. The visitors reverently gazed at the great sovereign. Some observed the masterpiece with admiration, while, others, while some others with bitter hearts imagined they flew for a moment towards the depth of centuries, visualized the glorious past of their ancestors, and remembered their present state. So, um, the, this account by um, Aram Varir reveals how the general public understood Ani's excavations at the time. Individuals read in the artifacts, especially the royal statue, a history of medieval greatness and sovereignty, and they drew a sharp contrast between this past and their current um, condition as subjugated uh, communities within Ottoman or Russian rule. Um, but I also want to want you to note this power that the statue seems to have to allow those who look at it to time travel, to fly back to the centuries of the past and to experience what the medieval world was like. Um, and um, let's remember that as we um, move forward to some other examples of the way Ani uh, is discussed. Um, during the period of the Russian ex excavations, information and images about Ani circulated more widely than ever. Uh, there are many uh, articles and books that recount visits to Ani, um, almost overwhelming in number, I have to say, descriptions of the Ani ruins and photographs by uh, great artists. Um, so, and this is when Ani becomes a magnet for artists. And the one I want to highlight briefly is Arshak Fetfajian, again, an Ottoman Armenian. So you can see that one of the claims I want to make here is to trace how Ottoman Armenians uh, embraced Ani just as much as, as uh, Russian Armenians embraced it at the time, uh, which is something that actually um, I, it, uh, Osman Bey and I uh, used to discuss quite extensively, sort of the, this Ottoman history of Ani that is uh, less, uh, less uh, understood or less highlighted. So Fetvajian, uh, who's active from 1866 and 1947, um, created a number of images of Ani. Here we are seeing his painting of the Church of Abu Hamrens, uh, which is today in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Um, and uh, under right is a booklet that was published at the time uh, called The Ruins of Ani, and that was um, available for purchase. And so his images circulated quite widely. Um, and uh, be became the image of Ani for many. Um, after 1922, when um, Ani was, uh, the museum at Ani was sacked and access to Ani was no longer possible, Fetvajian's um, images continued to circulate. What you're seeing here is um, a news item about an exhibition of 
the Fetvagian's Ani paintings that the painter organized at the Avery Library at Columbia University in 1922. So this is a very interesting moment where, um, you know, the genocide has just taken place, Ani has just been lost, and already we see Fetvagian and others in New York creating heritage about Ani, and of course now his paintings of Ani after the loss of Ani mean something very, very different. Um, uh, in addition to images of Ani, there were a number of texts, including, I wonder if any of our participants here know this novel. It's a novel by Bakrat Ayvazians, um, entitled either uh, Ani Gorzanuma, The Sack of Ani, or um, Ani Betrayed, Ani Zach Vetzav. Um, it, I, I, I remember reading this novel when I was a young person, and it's very, very vivid. Um, and I've uh, since uh, figured out that it has been in print continuously since 1905. There are many editions of this novel. Uh, it exists in two titles, but also in a West Armenian and East Armenian version. The text is um, fairly different, fairly distinct. So someone took the trouble to create two different versions of this novel. Um, and it, um, it is uh, said to be based on um, the famous 19th century novel by Edward Bulwer Lytton, uh, published in 1894, The Last Days of Pompeii, um, which is a historical novel that recreates uh, the last, the, the few days before uh, Pompeii was, of course, overrun by uh, the eruption of, uh, of uh, the volcano Vesuvius. So it's that kind of 19th century historical novel. It's very vivid. It features a number of uh, fictional characters as well as historical characters. And this novel was so popular, it was such a bestseller at the time in uh, various Armenian communities around the world, that we see its characters, including the fictional characters, come into circulation and become part of people's experience of what Ani is. Uh, so the evil character of Vest Sarkis, for example, is very much a very living, very present character for uh, many Armenians. Um, over the course of, oh, another thing I want to highlight is some um, editions of this novel are illustrated with this image. Um, and I'm very grateful to the, Dr. Vasken Davidian for walking me through this series of images. And here we see the same image reproduced in, uh, in a silver artwork. Um, that was the, so the silver artwork is probably created in the late 19th, early 20th century in Van or Tabriz. Um, and the image being depicted here is a painting by an artist called Giuliano Sasso in the 19th century that uh, was clearly an extremely popular image of the siege of Ani in 1042 that um, uh, depicts uh, Armenian and Byzantine armies in conflict. So we're seeing a very deep history of images that are created, that are recycled. Of course, we can see that the ramparts of Ani here are very, um, uh, they, they echo Texier's earlier engravings in his early 19th century book about Ani. So we're seeing the, the creation of a number of composite images uh, of Ani um, recreating medieval events and recreating present events that circulate very widely in a number of different media and create experiences of Ani for people, uh, especially for people who are not able to visit in person. And for much of the 20th century, this was the situation for most uh, visitors. Um, Ani uh, fell on the what was now one of only two land borders between the uh, USSR and the West. Um, and Ani became a, um, a very sensitive military zone on a very sensitive um, 
uh, international border. And so it was very, very difficult to access Ani in person, um, even for citizens of Turkey. Well, and so during, minute, what do you want it? Yeah, okay. um, so during this period, um, we're going to see number, I'm going to show you a number of examples that highlight this um, sense of being cut off from Ani. Uh, this image of the Church of uh, Tikran Homens uh, was taken by Ara Güler, uh, of course, Ara Güler being the great uh, Turkish-Armenian photographer. Um, this image is taken in 1965. It is today at the Freer and Sackler um, Gallery in Washington, D.C. It's part of a series of photographs that Güler took of Ani in 1965 at a time when it was no, this was not a widely visited place. And so um, I found this image very, very poignant because you have to remember that he is a Turkish Armenian in the difficult period of the 60s, standing, um, um, near, seeing the ruined church of uh, Dikran Homens. And this is, of course, the Ahurian or Arpachai River that divides uh, the West from the USSR. And so Armenia. Soviet Armenia is just out of reach. And it's as if he, in this image you see that he is you know, almost trying to extend his hand to touch what is uh, a kind of Armenia, but far away and inaccessible. And there are also tales of uh, the inaccessibility of Ani from Armenia. Uh, ironically, the best viewpoint for taking panoramic photographs of Ani is from Armenia, from this promontory on the Armenian side of the um, uh, of the Ahurian or Arpachai River. Um, and uh, those of you who have traveled to Armenia probably have experienced this very particular spot from where you go to take uh, photographs of yourself or your group looking at Ani. And again, the sense of it is just out of reach. You can almost touch it, but it is inaccessible. So I want to... Um, Think about that um, uh, feeling in that moment for, for a moment, um, acknowledging that during this time, uh, un, uh, up until the 1990s, uh, Ani was uh, it, difficult to access. Hi, can you, can you hear me now? I think I got cut off for a moment. So over um, the, up until the uh, 1990s, Ani was difficult to access. It was uh, sort of uh, abandoned, left to decay. Um, there was a great deal of vandalism. There were also, I mean, this is a very seismic area. There were a, a number of events that, uh, I mean, seismic events, I mean, that um, you know, certainly did not contribute to the state of uh, good preservation of the monuments. So um, here I want to explore um, one actually really large body of writings um, where people talk about experiencing Ani in very physical terms uh, without ever having set foot there. So here um, is Harry Harutunyan, um, who, uh, and he says, when I was younger, I had a recurring dream of walking in the ruins of Ani. So Harry Harutunyan, of course, who uh, grows up in uh, uh, the Midwest in the United States, has never set foot at Ani, but for him, um, the experience of visiting the site, of setting foot there, of you know, smelling the smells of Ani, experiencing the buildings, is very, very vivid. Um, and um, I want you um, all to remember the sh short story by William Soroyan that we all know so well, The Armenian and the Armenian from, I believe, 1934. Um, and that, short, that uh, short story is very famous for its ending where he says, you know, I'd like to see if they can destroy uh, Armenia, right? Uh, but in that short story, he also uh, says, um, and he's talking about Mush in that instance, he says, I can love a place I have never seen. And I want us to really think about what that means for a moment. What does it mean to love a place and know a place that you have never seen, that you have never been to, and that you are not 
going to go to. And um, along these lines, I want to introduce this poem that I suspect is less well known than many other poems that exist about Ani. Um, it was published in 1960, but likely written uh, much earlier. Um, the author is the poet Hamaster, who was born in Harput in 1895 um, and uh, lived in the United States um, after um, uh, the genocide, obviously. Um, and this poem is called Yeska Jan Schnamkes, I Recognize You. And um, it um, uh, stages an encounter uh, that take place in 1944 in Boston on Tremont Street between two individuals, two um, uh, people who don't know each other, uh, see each other on the street, and this triggers a memory where the narrator recognizes the person he is seeing in 1944 in Boston and remembers that this is someone he used to know, they were friends, and they both lived together in Ani in 1200. And the rest of the poem goes on to describe the experiences um, of these two friends at Ani, and uh, it's incredibly vivid. Uh, the Prince Ashot comes back from the hunt. They spend time in the bazaar. Um, they uh, are both in love with the same girl. So this is a very vividly imagined everyday life in medieval Ani, a very um, uh, a cosmopolitan medieval Ani. And if you indulge me, I want to read uh, one of the final paragraphs uh, because I want you to pay attention to how vividly it describes physical experiences in the medieval city. And so I'm not a poet, and this is my own translation into English, and I'm sure I do not do justice to uh, the poetry, but uh, uh, bear with me. Quote, when the bells of Ani rang, the thousand and one bells of Ani, the devils were chased away from the crevices of mountains and from the hearts of men. And men, Armenians, Greeks, Tatars, Persians, Arabs, pagans and Christians, thieves and, cr thieves and criminals, prostitutes, all of them, all of them were cleansed by the sound of the bells like white cloth just emerged from the wash. And within the ramparts and outside the ramparts, the camels took on thoughtful faces, like the old pages of a prayer book. And God walked through the fields of Ararat when the bells of Ani rang, the thousand and one bells of Ani. Sorry, yes, I find it very moving. So it's... Um, the poem uh, has this wonderful arc where we have the series of adventures that these two friends have at Ani, and it culminates in this beautiful, very moving evocation of, um, of the bells, and then they come back to Boston, and, but they don't speak, and so the two friends part. So, um, I... Uh, this poem is uh, not alone. It, it is part of a number of productions. Um, and here I'm showing you something that is uh, a poem that is very different in tone. Uh, it's, um, it's by Hovhannes Shiraz, the great Soviet Armenian poet, uh, To See Ani and Then to Die, Anin Desnel, uh, Anin Desnel Mernel, um, which is a, a very beautiful poem in his own way, but has a very different tenor and approach. And I'm happy to talk about it maybe later if people have questions. But um, I want to um, take a moment to, to try to, uh, to figure out how we can talk about these kinds of um, cultural productions. And I want to bring in a couple of ideas. One is, of course, from Peter Balakian, the great um, uh, Armenian-American poet, who has himself written poetry about Ani, but uh, Peter has actually visited Ani in the company of Professor uh, Rachel Goshkayan um, and has written a number of poems about his visits to Ani. But Peter also has a number of critical um, essays where he um, 
uh, it creates a theory about how we can think about Armenian sites, um, especially uh, uh, cultural heritage sites, religious and cultural monuments uh, in, that are in Turkey today. And so this is Peter Balakian writing, quote, whether an Armenian looks from across the border in Armenia or anywhere else, the ruins of Armenian culture inside present day Turkey are captive sites to which Armenians have no organic or even accessible relationship, unquote. So captive sites, this is this very evocative term that he uses. Um, this is him again, quote, inside Turkey, Armenian ruins represent a forbidden past, an irreclaimable history, a ruptured process of mourning, all inseparable from this paradox of an embodied absence, unquote. So it, it, this gives us a lot of um, interesting things to think about. And I also want to um, introduce to this uh, discussion um, some ideas uh, from um, the architectural historian Nikos uh, Margoliotis, who um, has been very interested in thinking about how buildings are remembered in texts. And in the case of Margoliotis, he analyzed um, a series of oral traditions, songs, and poems in Greek that memorialize Hagia Sophia specifically. And Margoliotis makes the observation that as a result of this uh, universe of verbal images, verbal texts, that memorialize and commemorated Hagia Sophia. For Greeks, he says, Hagia Sophia is, quote, uh, more a monument of the word than a monument of architecture, unquote. So th this is very, very interesting and um, something that um, is important for us to think about when we think about Ani as an object of memory for Armenians worldwide in the interaction between verbal images and um, architectural images um, and the role that the photograph plays in the, the memory of Ani. Um, so um, now I want to move to um, a few other uh, examples and bring in um, three very recent examples of artistic works that are inspired by and centered on Ani. Um, and the first one is um, um, a project uh, by Dikran Hamasyan, the uh, Armenian-American uh, performance artist and musician. Um, in this project called Lucy Lusso from 2015, um, uh, was supported by uh, Osman Kabala and Anadolu Kultur. Uh, in this project, uh, Hamasian had the idea of uh, um, staging a series of performances of his composition that was inspired by Armenian liturgical um, music and to uh, stage performances in a number of Armenian religious sites uh, in the Republic of Armenia and the Republic of Turkey. And in this image, you're seeing uh, Hamasian and his, um, and his uh, the, the, the group of singers uh, performing at Ani. And if um, someone can help me, Nick, uh, if you could share, or do you have the ability to share that? It's a very short video. I can't hear it. Um, did I do that, Nick, or did you? Oh, thank you.
Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you um, for sharing that. Um, so, um, uh, it, Hamasian uh, it, it places Ani in this uh, project in a continuum of uh, medieval sites throughout Armenia and um, in Turkey that becomes uh, reactivated through the power of uh, liturgical music, but it reinterpreted in a thoroughly modern way. Um, two additional artists I want to highlight uh, who have created work inspired by Ani recently. Um, one is uh, Francis Alice, um, who created a short video, it's about 13 minutes, I'm not going to ask you to watch it, but it's uh, publicly available on the website of the artist at the link here. He created this uh, short film uh, for the Istanbul Biennale that took place in 2015, of course, the centennial year of the Armenian Genocide. Uh, Alice is a very well-known and very interesting Belgian-Mexican artist who works in a number of different media, and especially video. And in general, he's known for exploring themes of urban life, borders, spatial justice, um, and his videos draw on politics and allegory. Um, and here, his short film is called The Silence of Ani. Here you're seeing uh, a scene of it um, being uh, the installation view in Istanbul in 2015, um, was specifically commissioned. And um, uh, he created this film at Ani with the cooperation of a group of teenagers uh, from um, a high school in Kars nearby. Um, in the film, we see the deserted ruins of Ani in stark black and white. All that can be heard is the wind and the rustling wildflowers. And one soon notices movement. They, it's the young teenagers hidden among the broken stones. They seem to play hide and seek. They play small flutes to make bird sounds to try to call back the birds that once inhabited this landscape. The children's bird calls break the silence silence to go on until the birds return and the old city comes back to life. It is a truly beautiful um, film and um, I, I recommend that you, if you have a chance that you uh, watch it. The final uh, artistic work I want to highlight is that of a very different artist, a Taiwanese artist named Ze Wei, born in 1985. Um, I'm not quite sure how she became interested in Ani, but she's created uh, several series of photographs or photographic collages on Ani uh, from 2014 and 2015. 
Um, she, as a, a multimedia artist, uh, Zeve is interested in urban spaces and historic form and various ways of understanding historic forms. For her Ani series, she photographs thousands of visual fragments of each ruin. And here we're seeing uh, Gakkashen, the church of King Gakiga at Ani. Uh, she photographs them from different perspectives, different times of day, and later assembles these photographic fragments in an incredibly painstaking process uh, in the manner of an archaeologist into a different image, a new image. And she calls these trembling landscapes. This is her term. And you can see how, yes, one does get the sense that these are trembling landscapes. Um, these are disconcerting images. They contrast the monumentality of the ruins and the multiplicity of fragments. I find them very, very evocative. So, um, I'm going to stop here and uh, I'm uh, happy to engage in a discussion. And I know I left many things out. There are many more examples of poems and images and artistic projects on Ani. Um, I just uh, picked a few for to help us um, think about some of the threads that run through all of these and just want um, uh, to, to convey a sense of how rich the landscape of memory at Anyi has been and continues to be. And uh, this is the this image of Anyi is not frozen in time, but rather always open to new creative interpretations. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much, Hevna. That was really wonderful and, and, and at times really um, moving as well, uh, bringing to life all the ways in which Annie has been lived and, and experienced, uh, and by 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 Armenians who, as you say, haven't, often haven't even been there. Um, so thank you. I'm sure there are lots of questions. Um, as I said, please uh, make use of the uh, raise hand function, or you can post a little cue into the chat if you'd like to ask a question yourself, um, and you can ask a question directly, or you can uh, uh, you can write your question into the chat and I'll read it out for Hevna. Um, but maybe while people are uh, are thinking of what questions they'd like to ask, I'll uh, use my position to ask one of my own. Um, that poem uh, that you, the, the poem, I, I missed the, the name of the, of the poet, um, where it's uh, imagining Annie in 1200, um, which is, indicate to yourself it's just so moving and I really I love the counterposition of those two different moments in time um and that the and the eloquence in itself that the, the, the person who he sees in the street they don't even talk um but there's this whole epic um I just I don't really have even a specific question I'd just love to hear more about that I think firstly 1200 seems a really interesting date yeah. is it yeah is it so Ani in 1200, or is that Bagratuni Ani and the dates are just a little bit off? Or, um, and also the mention that he talks about the bazaar as well. Um, yeah. So is some of the imagery imagining also Ottoman Armenia before the mm -hmm. genocide? Mm -hmm. that, um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, that's a great question. I think you just gave uh, the answer. I don't know why he's picked 1200. Um, so Hamaster, uh, this is his pen name, um, is uh, is known in Armenian literature as um, you know for his uh, stories that recreate the life of his village. So there, it's part of a movement in diaspora Armenian literature. They're known as kurakirs, those who write about villages. And you know, he has a series of really beautiful short stories that recreate village life in um, you know the Ottoman Empire just before the First World War. And they're very, uh, very beautiful, very poetic. Poetic um, in general, not political at all. Um, Though he also has uh, an epic novel called Spidaxiavora, the White Horseman, which is sort of an imagined epic uh, set in a you know uncertain historic time, but in you know the before time when villages the village life existed. So um, this poem is the only one that I'm aware of where he 
talks about a historic, a medieval historic period. Um, I don't know why he picks 1200. I'm not sure he is very familiar with the history of Ani. Um, it's very difficult to get a sense of where he's getting his information. Uh, I would strongly suspect that he's getting the information from novels like Ivaz Jans rather than, you know, he's not going to read Mar. That's just not part of the kind of intellectual um, that he is. Um, so it, 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 for, for him, I did, there are the Ani that is recreated is there's the cathedral, there's a few architectural landmarks, but it really is um, an atmosphere, a feeling of this cosmopolitan medieval city. And I think what you said is uh, comes probably closest to an interesting interpretation, which is he is recreating some kind of Ottoman. Armenian city or Ottoman city where Armenians also have a presence. Um, it's not historically specific, but it's very sensory. I mean, the sound of the bells, the smells, uh, the, the different colors at the bazaar, the textile. One of the, the two friends um, is an apprentice weaver of church uh, curtains. It's, it's, it's a huge poem. It's very, very long. And so we have a lot of discussions of the process of weaving and the colors that they use in the weaving and the master student, um, master apprentice relationship and so on. So it's, um, I, I'm very intrigued by this poem. I think it is very poetic. It's, but what I find a, um, very remarkable is the, the, the overload of sensory things. It's, and, um, and in the Boston section as well, because in the end, um, the narrator goes into the Armenian restaurant on Tremont Street. It's very funny to think of an Armenian restaurant in Tremont Street because now it's so gentrified, but you know, back then it was an ethnic enclave. And so he goes into an Armenian restaurant and eats hush, which is an incredibly garlicky, incredibly sort of slimy, very sort of um, sensory food. So um, it, it's so deeply observed, so physical and and he's creating this world about a place to which he has never been, to which he will never go. Uh, but it, it has to be on me. It's not another place. Yeah, it's, it's really it's fascinating. And I wonder, in the, in, you mentioned that he celebrates that it's a really multi-ethnic city. Mm -hmm. It's got this uh, mm -hmm. Armenian soul, but it's a multi-ethnic city. Does that contrast, because I've never read um, Ani Betrayed or the Sack of Ani. Um, I've only seen bits about it, so I don't even really know. Um, I should, actually, because my PhD was on uh, Aristakes Lastivaxi, uh -huh. so I'm sure that lots of the imagery of Sarkis and things like this is being drawn from it. But I, um, to my shame, I've never got around to it. So does that contrast? Is, is, is Ani Betrayed more of an emphatically... Armenian space, uh, whereas mm. Hamasdech mm. is is mm -hmm. creating, as you say, this mm -hmm. really vibrant vision of his of his own past in in mm. in, in a multi ethnic Ottoman world. That's really interesting. Um, I don't know. I would I would like to know more about Ivasians, the the author of that novel. It's. Um, I think there has been some work on him by historians of literature. Um, it's, it, I can't, I don't, there's so many questions. Uh, who is this guy? Why does this novel take off so much? Um, there's very little work done on these popular novels. I mean, this is not high literature. These are not the great figures of Armenian literature that we celebrate. These are sort of the, you know, Michael Crichtons of their day. Um, yeah. Who is he? What is he doing? Where is he getting his information? Who are these characters? I don't know. Um, and it's been a while since I've read Ivazians, but... Um, I, I think it's definitely on the, uh, on the Armenian side, but it's about um, how Armenians are betrayed. So that, that's a whole other thread of, uh, you know, the, 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 the wretched Ani, you know, black fated Ani, Sef Pacht Ani, you know, uh, Ani, which stands for the fact that, you know, the, the fate of Armenians is always dark. We are always going to lose. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I I would I would love if so anybody knows anyone who has done work on Ivaz Janssen, his weird series of incredibly popular novels, I would be very interested in learning more. Yeah, and um, and especially, have you got any plans to translate the the rest? Um, of the it's How very long. It? It's very long. It's like uh, twenty pages in you know very fine print, um, published in nineteen sixty, and I don't think it's very well known. Um, but it's that his whole I think his poetry is not well known. It, it it's very beautiful. Um, I'm not sure I have the poetic talent to translate it but it's a very powerful poem well it was very moving the trans the short section that you are able to translate um i think unless there's uh, a burning question or anyone who wants to uh, to jump in um Another strand that I wanted to pick up on that I thought was really interesting uh, in talk was when you're saying, so this was referred to as um, uh, Armenian Palmyra, um, mm -hmm. but as, as you pointed out, um, uh, Palmyra, or, but not only Palmyra, also Troy, uh, mm -hmm. also Minoan Crete, these, these, uh, 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 these sites in the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East they weren't uncovered by Caucasians, by by mm -hmm. by, by Cretans mm -hmm. themselves, by uh, mm -hmm. Western uh, Anatolians themselves. Um, they were imperial figures coming from afar. Now, Mar is obviously part acting on behalf of the um, uh, Russian imperial project. But it's interesting, right? That the reason why we don't have so little from Ani is because the museum was right there. We have so much from so many of these other places, mm -hmm. comparatively speaking. Mm -hmm. um, because they were taken, they were taken to mm -hmm. uh, to Berlin and to, mm -hmm. and to London. So I wonder if you had more that you were that you've been thinking mm -hmm. through here about this agency that mm -hmm. we have here. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting thing about the history of Ani. Well, there are two things. One, I'm very intrigued that it's called Ar Armenian Palmyra, and that's the earliest mention of that I've seen is 1841. Apovian calls it Armenian Palmyra. Um, I don't know why Palmyra is what's compared to it. Um, as you mentioned, there are a number of other sites that are being discussed discovered around this time. Um, I think it really shows that the excavation or the rediscovery of Ani was an, an imperial project for sure, but it was also a local project um, and, a, and a complex one. Not everyone had the same picture about Ani. There was uh, one very interesting figure that I didn't mention is Gurdjieff. Uh, I don't know if people know him. I didn't know anything about him, but he is a huge figure in alternative religions. Um, Gurdjieff was a uh, Greco-Armenian from uh, what is what we now call Gyumri, uh, Alexandropol at the time. And um, he is known for his uh, new religion, the Fourth Way, um, that is based on uh, sort of um, you know, a mystical understanding of ancient wisdoms. And he had uh, a school in, um, in Paris for many, many years, and his religion is still very much alive. Um, uh, and, and it's a global religion. And there are scholars of religion that have studied Gurdjieff. In his autobiography, Gurdjieff talks about his spiritual awakening, which takes place. Guess where? Uh, he and a friend, he says, of course, nothing he says can be taken. <laughs> you can't take him at his word, but he says he lived in among the ruins at Ani with a friend for for many years. And uh, in one of the caves at Ani, he discovers um, manuscripts that contain the wisdom of the ancients in a, a previously unknown language, which he, of course, instantly reads. And as he is reading and absorbing this uh, ancient knowledge, the manuscripts disintegrate. So Ani is the site where the, the transmission of the knowledge, the esoteric knowledge of the ancient world and the new knowledge takes place. And Gurdjieff is spending time at Ani, or he is you know, assuming that this is a factual episode, uh, right before the excavations. So, um, so that's a whole other approach 
approach to Ani. We know more about the Armenian nationalist version of Ani and the place of Ani in this imagining of sovereign, lost sovereignty and so on. Uh, but there's also this alternative religion approach to Ani that I think is something to, to explore. There's a, the whole tradition of uh, people who have had mystical and religious experiences at Ani have had visions. Um, I mean, once you start looking, then there's so many. It is actually overwhelming. Wow, that I had... Absolutely, never heard of anything like that. Ani sort of providing <laughs> Damascus moments, or something like a, like Joseph Smith, like the founder of the Mormons, or something yeah. like that. That's, yeah, that's really mm -hmm. fascinating. Um, but we have a question um, from one of our attendees. So, uh, Saruhi Hakopian, if you could, I think you'll be asked to unmute, please. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Doctor Watni Pao, for your lecture and uh, showing us uh, another side of Ani's history. It is very interesting. Uh, I have uh, no, not a question, uh, but uh, I just want to give you a small information. You mentioned, uh, mentioned uh, that a great statue of uh, the King Gagik, and you said, uh, of course, it's true that it was, it was lost many years ago, but uh, I want uh, to say, uh, do you know that uh, a part of this statue was discovered in 1994? Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, this information is very important. This is a kind of uh, continuing of uh, story funny. Yes, um, I know. I've I've seen the fragment. Um, yeah, it, it is it is true. There's also another fragment in the Azeru Museum, um, and of course we we have this story. Who knows if it's true that um, uh, Kalantar uh, Kalantar, the archaeologist who was the last person to leave Ani, buried the head of Gagik in a safe place. Who knows? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's uh, the history of that statue is very, very interesting, um, and I'm sure there will be more episodes to come in the future. Thank yes. you so much. I hope to. <laughs> to yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we refuse to believe that it's lost. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Hopefully, there will be. Some. And it actually, um, the statue was something was another thing that I wanted to to come back to in the um, from your talk because I think it's really interesting some of the contrast that you indicated between what the statue represents from the medieval historian or an art historian's perspective, which is really Gagik as a part of yeah. the broader world. Yeah. You have imagery mm -hmm. like that from mm -hmm. Antium uh, to Baghdad, mm -hmm. um, also of course on Akhtamar, mm -hmm. There's a very mm -hmm. very similar representation um but this uh with the turban and all that um which does seem to contrast quite strongly with the way in which it was experienced yeah. by people when yeah. it was rediscovered which is as this symbol of a lost sovereignty mm -hmm. something something more particular mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's fascinating i mean it, there are so many areas where the way in which visitors seem to experience ani completely diverges from the way scholars uh, approached Ani. Um, Mars, inter Mars' own interpretations of Ani, which changed over time, um, were also very different. And at some point he talks about how he's a little bit frustrated at the way in which um, you know, local people are talking about Ani, where he has a very different idea of what the city represented. So we, you were seeing that there's a, a very quickly there's a gulf between you know history and memory, scholarship and memory when it comes to Ani. And is there any indication of the how Ani was imagined or positioned by the locals pr at yeah. the moment of this rediscovery? Yeah. Um, you mean by the very locals, the, like the villagers yes, the who were there? The yeah, that, I think that's a really important question, and I've worked very hard to find evidence of that. There is a uh, Turkish language um, ethnography of the people in this region that uh, was published, I believe, in the 70s. And so that, yeah, there you get a sense of that. Um, but... Um, 
uh, of all places, uh, there was a report issued um, in the early 2000s. Uh, it, it's the transcript of a stakeholder meeting um, of the local villagers that was uh, conducted when um, uh, Ani was going to be put on the tentative list for UNESCO and it was required uh, for uh, the UNESCO bureaucracy. And um, so this transcript exists and in it, it it's incredible. There, there, are uh, accounts there that you never hear anywhere else. Um, and uh, there's an, um, in it, the villagers talk about what they think of Ani. And one villager, uh, th these are the, vill this is the village of Ojakla, right next door to Ani, where people uh, live there now. And these are people who have lived next to Ani for, for decades. And in fact, sometimes their houses are made up of stones uh, harvested from Ani. And so uh, one of the speakers talks about how their grandmother told them that uh, at night, Ani comes alive. It's a dead city in the day and a living city at night. So if you, you're there at night, you see that light comes on. Bread is being baked. You smell the, the smell of bread baking. Again, it's very, very sensory. It's remarkable, isn't it? Um, and, uh, you know, people walk on the streets and it's a living city in the nighttime and you should never go there at night. So it's, um, I find that very, very valuable sense of how uh, the people who live around Ani uh, see it. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> um, uh, but then the point is you should never go there, that it's a city. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, Ar um, the Armenians come out at night. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but it, and it connects to to one of the things that I'll take with me from Christina's talk last week. There's this the parts of the excavation of that hole in the citadel with the tonier in it, the, with some yeah. of divided up between sort of abandonment and mm -hmm. rediscovery. Mm -hmm. And it was still a village, and it was still yeah. a place where yeah. moving through in a place of use and and. It never it, it it always transformed a function in a way. Obviously, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. It's never an, an empty place, uh, but it, it's there's always people living there. It's just these are villages that we don't think about or we don't uh, pay importance to. But uh, there's also a whole literature that I didn't mention on Ani as pilgrimage destination I mean, from the 17th century onwards. I mean that that is a continuing tradition of going to Ani for pilgrimage, people who uh, see themselves as Anetsi, who now live in Rostov or other places in the world, but uh, trace their ancestry to Ani and go on pilgrimages there. So it's, there are many, many strands. So yes, it was, uh, you know, uh, we think of Ani as timeless, empty, mysterious, but there were always people doing things there. Yes, it's really fascinating. Um, so if there's any more questions, then please, please do ask. I, I honestly, I could, um, uh, ah, Diana, um, who's joining us says, thank you. There's also a, a song based on the poem of, of Shiraz about ah. me, um, that, uh, uh, used to sing at school. Now is this, Diana, is this the song that's about, um, Ani Karak, uh, how's it going? Ani Karak. No, this is, uh, to see Ani and to die. Anin Besnel Unoritz Mernel, right? I'm, I'm not saying it right. Um, but Anikarak Mestergula is also a song. And yes. Zabeli Sayan talks about it in her memoirs. Yes, one of my <laughs> colleagues, uh, Olivia, who's with us tonight, had, uh, had, was reading these and, um, and uh, was sent, sent them to me. Also, very usefully, because it's, it was um, in. Uh, that story, it was um, sung by her grandmother as a soothing song at night, and I have two very young children, so I was trying to adapt it. But I really, mm -hmm. what, what is the tune for, for these? I don't know, Dana, if you know what the tunes were, um, or, or for Anika um, What are the, are there, are there traditional song, uh, rhythm tunes that they were set to, or are they their own? I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm going to look for it. Thank you, Diana. Well, that's one for us to... Yeah, there's a whole Soviet imagination of Ani that um, 
Um, there's a whole Soviet uh, imagination of Ani that, um, you know, is its own uh, very deep and very interesting development. And there you, you have this added poignancy where you can see it. In fact, you have the best view of Ani from uh, the Soviet side, but you can't go there. Uh, so there, um, and, and as my research continues, I'm, I'm finding more and more projects, including by architects in the Soviet period, to, um, uh, to, to highlight that viewpoint. So that to be continued, that, that's still very new. Uh, is Ani in any Armenian movies? Hmm. Uh, no, but it's in a lot of music videos. <laughs> Um, that's a really interesting question. I think that's something that I should ask uh, Vigen Galistian, who is a specialist of the history of uh, Armenian cinema. That's a great question, Irene. Thank you. So I think um, uh, if there are any more questions, please do ask. One, another thing that I wanted to come back to, you mentioned the... Um, uh, the connection with Soviet Armenians. Another another thing that you uh, that you emphasized in your talk was this phenomenon of Ottoman Armenians and their mm -hmm. connection with money. Mm -hmm. And something you mentioned uh -huh. that you discussed um, a, a lot with uh, with Osman Bey. So, um, is there more that you to say to say on this? This, um, yeah. What what are the real what are the yeah. Thank you for asking that. So that was something that uh, really struck me when I started uh, studying Ani, how many of the uh, really important projects and interventions uh, and people that we have at Ani are actually Ottomans. I think we think of Toros Ramanian because of where his career took place as sort of a Soviet Armenian figure, but uh, you know, he's very much, um, his formation is in Istanbul, he's very much an Ottoman, um, an Ottoman Armenian. So but it's one of the things that was really important for me to highlight when I started uh, working on Ani that um, it's, yes, it has a very deep connection to the Eastern Armenian community and to the subsequent development of Armenian architecture um, in Yerevan and so on, but um, it, it also has a very deep connection to Ottoman Armenian communities and Turkish Armenians of, of Aragüler's photographs. Um, so with Osman, at one point we even discussed maybe doing some kind of project or exhibition that highlights that connection between the Turkish Armenian community and um, and Ani. I think you know it, it, it's a very important connection that has. Sort of, it is sometimes not seen, um, and maybe for our colleagues um, in the Republic of Armenia, it's less clearly seen, and so that was always important for me to highlight. Well, thank you so much for that, um, Hegna. And if there aren't ah, so Tupa uh, Tanyari Erdemir has a question saying, "Is there any consciousness or references?" Um, to the first Ani Museum being in a form of That mosque, is so. such a great question. Uh, thank you, Tuba. That is a really great question. Um, yes, I wish Christina was here because she knows the documents from that period so well. I'm. My instinct is going to say that no. Um, no, there, it, there's. You don't really have a sense that. Um, caveat: Maybe Christina has a different view, or um, others who have worked on these materials may have a different view. But my impression thus far is that uh, the people involved in the excavation don't really think of or spend time talking about Ani as an Islamic site, even though there's an Islamicist. Um, in the uh, on the excavation team, Bartold is there, who is you know a noted um, Russian and later Soviet Islamicist. He's the one who deciphers the uh, Arabic inscriptions. So they have an Islamicist on site, and he's doing his research. But um, I I want to say in most of the publications on Ani, the early, at least during the period of excavation. That's not highlighted. 
though it's there. I mean, they you it, they do say it's a um, you know it was a mosque. Uh, inscription is there and so on. But yeah, but that's a really good question that deserves further um, further study. Thank you, Tuwa. Yeah, I think the 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 mosque in, in particular, um, but also Islamic mm -hmm. in general is mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, research yeah. Is interesting in itself, but Munichi here chose to to either reconvert that building or to build entirely mm -hmm. new that mosque mm -hmm. there rather than another mosque, in, a church in the citadel or the mm -hmm. cathedral, mm -hmm. uh, which was at some point later then become a mosque. But the, the, there seems to be a very interesting um, interplay yeah. between Islamic and, yeah. and, of course, I think this is something that can be. Uh, uh, that needs a lot more yeah. research and hopefully yeah absolutely the, uh, the network of, of scholars that we want to uh, launch with this with this series um will uh take that in hand as well as many of the other things that mm -hmm. has spoken about with mm -hmm. us today um so thank you so much everyone for coming and thank you so much to Hegna for a really wonderful talk um it was really uh perfect evening um or whatever <laughs> time of the day uh it is for all of you um just at the end as i said firstly this is to launch a, 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 a network around our so if you're interested in that then please do get in touch um at nick at armenianinstitute.org.uk um thank you all for coming if you enjoyed the event tonight or if you have suggestions for how we can improve our events then please do leave feedback on the feedback form i've just put that into the chat um and if you are able uh then um please do uh and if you feel to be generous then please do support us at the armenian institute we rely on the uh generosity of our community to run events like this um the next and final uh, talk in this series will be not next week, but the week after on Tuesday, the 27th of July. And that will be with Dr. Yavuz Ozkaya uh, from uh, Kemakade, from the Association of Protection of Cultural Heritage, talking about the preservation and archaeology of our need today. Um, so it'll be a really great way to finish and to think about where we want to go next. So please do join us for that. Um, and otherwise, uh, have a lovely day wherever you are, in London, Bari Kishir, Bari Yeriko, and uh, see you all soon. Thank you. <laughs>